My name is Chris Thorogood. I'm the Head of Science and Public Engagement here at Oxford Botanic Garden. And today I'm going to be talking about this monster of a flower, Rafflesia. Rafflesia is the largest flower on earth. And here we have a replica of it to show you just how big that really is. Imagine the amazement of the first botanical explorers when they set eyes on a flower this size in the rainforests of Sumatra. On the 19th of May in 1818, a local unnamed guide in Sumatra exclaimed, Come, come look, a flower, amazing, very large, beautiful, to Sir Stamford Raffles and Dr Joseph Arnold. And so this giant flower was introduced to for the first time officially to the Western world. Um, I've always been fascinated by Rafflesia. For as long as I can remember, um, I can recall poring over picture books and looking at this um, gargantuan flower um, and really marvelling at the scale of this thing. How on earth could something be so large in the plant kingdom? I was lucky enough to see this plant in the wild in the rainforest of northern Borneo some years ago. There is a mountain in northern Borneo called Kinabalu, um, and it's arguably one of the most important places on the planet botanically. Um, there are so many different species of plant growing on this mountain. It's dripping with orchids, pitcher plants, and if you're lucky enough to see it, um, around the rainforests at the base of the mountain grows Rafflesia, um, the largest flower in the world. And I had a local guide take me to come and see this flower growing in the rainforest, and that's something that you can just never forget. Of course, people have known about this long before it was introduced to the Western world. Um, it's very much celebrated in Southeast Asia where these plants grow naturally in, in, in the rainforest. Um, and it's, it's uh, very much celebrated. You see it on the front of stamps, on um, packets of food, on posters. Um, and it's even got a name, Patma, which symbolises um, its believed use in, in fertility as well. Now, what makes Rafflesia the largest flower? How do we know this is the biggest flower on Earth? Um, well, you may have seen the Titanarum, which sometimes flowers in botanic gardens. And this is often touted by the press as the largest flower on earth. Actually, the Titanarum isn't, because technically, botanically speaking, that plant is actually produces a whole group of tiny flowers called an inflorescence. Whereas this, this Rafflesia, this produces a flower um, that grows up to 150 centimetres across, but is one single flower. So yes, Rafflesia is the largest flower on earth. And why do we have a replica of it? The reason is that we simply can't grow this in the Western world. We really wish we could. It's never been cultivated outside of its native range in the rainforests of Southeast Asia. Um, it's a very, very difficult plant to grow. Now, why is that? To understand that, we need to look a little more at the biology of the plant. So, Rafflesia is a parasitic plant. Now, about 1% of all flowering plants are actually parasitic. And that means that they steal nutrients and water from other green plants. You'll notice Rafflesia has no green leaves, it has no roots, no stems, and it never will have. This is a highly unusual plant. It begins life as a tiny seed, and these seeds respond to certain chemical cues produced by the roots of its so-called host plant. And when it identifies the correct host, which in this case is a tropical vine called a tetrastigma, it will latch onto it and it will grow embedded within the tissues of its host as something called an endophyte. And you can think of this, it's been described as um, like tapping off electricity illegally connecting to the local grid um, undetected and, 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 and tapping off power. That's effectively what this plant does. It lives inside the tissues of its host for an unknown period, probably for three or four, five years maybe, gradually growing in a, in a very diminutive, reduced vegetative state, nothing like the flower you see here. And then, very suddenly, it starts to enter its reproductive phase and it produces a bud that slowly swells on the forest floor, growing like a, a large red cabbage. Um, and about 90% of these buds are aborted, which may be because the host plant, the tetrastigma, is able to, to reject the parasite. But some of them will reach maturity, and then, during the course of about a day, these five large petal-like lobes unfurl um, to, to show this giant flower. And you can see it's got this large disc-like diaphragm and a central part with spiky processes. And, and by the way, we don't really know um, about what those actually do. Um, so that's Rafflesia itself. 
So we know it's a, a parasitic plant. It doesn't have any chlorophyll. It doesn't photosynthesize. But why does it look like it does? It's red. It's warty. You could be forgiven for saying it's a bit ugly. It's a rather ghastly looking thing. Um, the clue is that it's actually pollinated by flies. So it's not pollinated by bees like many flowers are. Um, and the reason is that this flower has a deceptive means of pollination. So it pretends to be a big rotting corpse on the rainforest floor. And by the way, the real thing smells absolutely disgusting. It smells like rotting meat. It looks a bit like rotting meat. And it's very attractive to flies. And these flies team around the flower in their hundreds. And anyone who's seen anything large and rotting in, in a warm climate will know just how effective that must be at attracting these flies. And they crawl into this chamber um, that you can see in the centre of the flower. And um, there are little hairs and ridges that direct the flies right into the body of the flower, underneath in the area you can't see. And if they enter a male flower, because these are separate male and female flowers, um, they, they enter these tiny little crevices underneath this spiny disc here. And then it saddles these flies with a dollop of sticky pollen. So from the plant's point of view, this plant will have got what it wanted. The flies have entered, they're covered in pollen, and these flies then fly off. And flies can travel great distances, tens of kilometres over the period of a few days. And if they happen to visit a female flower that's receptive during this period, the same thing happens. They climb into the flower, and then they glue this pollen onto the female receptive part. And then the plant has been cross-pollinated, which is exactly um, what the plant is trying to achieve with these giant flowers. Um, the plant will then produce a large fruit um, with close to 300,000 tiny seeds. And we don't know very much about how these seeds are dispersed. Um, some people have speculated they may be small mammals that eat it on the forest floor, or it may be ants that, that are transporting these seeds. But somehow these many thousands of seeds um, are distributed across the rainforest floor, and some of them may just fall within reach of another tetrastigma where they can grow and the whole thing starts again. Now, this process of pollination, of attracting flies, is not peculiar to Rapplesia. There are actually many examples of flowering plants that produce these bogus corpses. They're sometimes called corpse lilies. Not very glamorous, to be fair, um, but they attract flies as a very efficient means of pollination. Um, they don't need to produce sugary nectar, which is very expensive to produce. Um, and this process, this form of pollination, is called sapromyophily, and it's actually... Um, very, a very accurate form of mimicry because the plant produces volatile compounds such as oligosulfides that we know from looking at the chemistry of these that they're very, very similar to the chemicals that are produced by rotting meat. Um, so there is a reason that this flower looks so ugly and smells so disgusting. And that may also be linked to the size of the flower as well. So flies will always be looking for the largest carcass they can find because it's a very good source of meat for them to lay their eggs and the carrion is a good source of food for, for their larvae. And so maybe these flowers were under strong selective pressures to produce bigger and bigger flowers that look and smell more and more like a dead animal to attract flies to pollinate them. Who said botany wasn't sexy? Um, so why is the flower so rare? Um, part of this, as I said, is that you have separate male and female flowers, um, and the chances of you having them flower at the same time um, are sometimes quite remote. That's one reason. Another reason is that these plants grow in rainforests that, as we all know, are very vulnerable to destruction. And it's really, really important that we conserve Rafflesia in particular for the reason that we simply can't grow this in many botanic gardens around the world to conserve it. So it's vital that we protect the rainforest where this, where this grows. So the next question is, how did such a flower ever evolve? What do we know about the evolution of Rafflesia? And that's something I'm particularly interested in. For a long time, this question defied scientists, and no one was sure what the closest relatives of Rafflesia really were. I mean, look at it. It looks completely different to any other flowering plant we know. Now, scientists were deprived of the features that we have with most plants to understand where it sits on the family tree. It doesn't have green leaves. It doesn't have typical stems or roots like most plants. So we're left with very few clues to elucidate where this plant evolved in, in the plant family tree, in the plant kingdom. More than that, when scientists started sequencing DNA, um, which they did some years ago, um, if you sequence the chloroplast DNA, which is what scientists typically do to understand how plants are related to one another, 
what you find is that the chloroplast DNA in this plant is pretty much defunct because clearly it has no chloroplasts because it makes no chlorophyll and it doesn't photosynthesize. It has no need to because it steals all its food from other green plants. So if you look at the DNA, it doesn't really give you any clues because it's evolved at a very different rate. So we can't use that. So really, it was a few years ago that we, that we only just discovered where this plant um, evolved, 200 years after its initial discovery almost. Um, and that was through sequencing mitochondrial DNA. And what scientists found was just so surprising because the closest photosynthetic relatives of this vegetable vampire are actually euphorbias. And anyone who knows euphorbias knows that they've typically got very, very tiny flowers. And that's just fascinating because clearly during the evolution of this monster, something has happened that has allowed this to become some kind of giant. In fact, it's, it's grown 79-fold in terms of its diameter compared with its nearest photosynthetic relatives. And we know that that was during a period of about 46 million years after it diverged from those related plants. Um, and it's, it's grown huge. And that may be linked to its form of pollination, as, as we mentioned before. Scientists have also looked at some of the closest non-photosynthetic relatives of Rafflesia. Um, there's another plant similar to this, but much, much smaller, called Sapria, which also grows on the rainforest floor. And interestingly, scientists, when they looked at the genetic signature that's involved in producing the floral architecture that you see in front of you, what they found was that this um, part here, um, this disc part, actually um, is is derived from a very different part of floral tissue than that of sapria. So they seem to have evolved the flowers in different ways. Sapria seems to have evolved a, a ring-like structure that is from tissue more like that of a daffodil, the, the, the round part of a daffodil that everyone's familiar with. So clearly, um, these plants have evolved down different paths in terms of this floral gigantism. Um, so we're starting to piece together the jigsaw of how Rafflesia evolved, but there's just so much more to learn. So coming back to why this display is here in Oxford, the ambition behind creating a, a life-size 3D replica of this giant flower that I think you'll agree is, is the biggest botanical enigma that there is in the plant kingdom, is to bring this flower to life for people who, very few of us get the chance to actually see this plant growing naturally in the rainforest of Southeast Asia. You don't know when they're going to flower, they're very rare, um, and they're very difficult to see in the wild. And so what we wanted to do was to really bring this to life um, so that other people can appreciate just how big this flower really is. And so this plant will be on display here in Oxford for eight days, which is how long Rafflesia blooms for in the rainforests um, in its natural setting in Southeast Asia. Uh, so we hope you'll come along to Oxford Botanic Garden, come and see the flower in the flesh, and share your photos with us with hashtag Rafflesia in Oxford, because we'd love to see them.